I'm a professor Cornell, but I'm a local Ithacan. As it happens, I live near Ithaca College, up on uh, Troy Road above Ithaca College. And uh, I have friends there in the chemistry department, and one of them, Professor Anna Larson, invited me to give a lecture. And then I talked with her about what kind of a talk should I give, and we decided on something a little bit less technical, but perhaps, but still very much for a chemistry, though in part for a general audience, about the kind of chemistries which people did and do before there ever was such a thing as a professional chemist. Protochemistries is the subject of the talk. Um, it is about the kind of chemistry which people did before there were chemists. And they didn't call it chemistry, of course. They were making dyes. People were always interested in uh, increasing the color in our environment, in our clothing, in our houses. Or they were making medicines or winning medals from their ores for military purposes, perhaps a great driver. Uh, people were making materials to curl your hair or uncurl it. And they, they didn't wait for chemists to do these things. Uh, they did it before. And I'm very interested in what they did. And one reason I'm interested in it is because it's ingenious and anonymous. And it's interesting to find out how those things were done. So it takes a current detective story to unravel what was done in the past, because no one wrote down those secret recipes. These chemistries so ingenious, done by ordinary people, families of craftsmen. They Somehow these stories humanize chemistry. So chemistry is not done by people in white coats out there who have to study for X years before they can do it. I'll tell a story of how soap was made on an American farm at the turn of the last century, 100 years ago. It was made on every farm in the world uh, where it could be done. And th those are, they're great stories. They're human stories. I think chemistry as a science was really born around 250 years ago in England and France. Uh, Science as such is a Western European invention, not an American one. Um, but it, it certainly spreads as a way of gaining reliable knowledge of this universe across the world. Around that time, 250 years ago, people had enough of these transformations. And there was a magic associated with them. So in chemistry, there is another thread weaving into chemistry. And this is alchemy trying to transform things for purposes of improving our life. Chemistry was always there. That was one of my points. It still is here. It looks like we've been put on this earth to transform it. I don't say this because I'm religious. I'm just stating a, a verity, I think, about human nature. Much of industry is chemical in its nature, whether it's making fertilizers from phosphate rock or from the nitrogen of the atmosphere, making pharmaceuticals for sure, but just the basic winning of metals from their ores, making the raw stuff of our, of our world, whether it's metals or paint or concrete to launch a building, you take something from that's natural and you transform it. That always was there. It is there. It is the mainstay of our industry. And it always will be there. So incidentally, I'm not worried about jobs for chemists, because there always will be there. They may be different in nature. Uh, these things have certainly changed, but uh, they always will be there. So I am in very interested in visual art. It all begins in college. 
um, which is good for people to know. And for me, it began at Columbia in New York City, where there was a core curriculum which involved courses in history of art and music of art and music and poetry. And I took those and literature and I was turned on to poetry and I was turned on to visual arts. And one way of summarizing what happened to me in college was that I, I worked up enough courage to tell my parents that I didn't want to be a real doctor. There was a lot of pressure on the only child in an immigrant family to become a physician. But I didn't work up enough courage to tell them that I wanted to study history of art or journalism. Uh, I just didn't have it, but I was interested in art. And so I went into chemistry. It was a compromise. I didn't decide on being a chemist professionally till halfway through my PhD in chemistry. And then I decided, and then it was lots of fun. It's been lots of fun. But I've kept alive these other interests in writing, so I feel that I'm a writer also. And I write poetry, plays, nonfiction. Ithaca College faculty actually participated in the first reading of a first play of mine in Ithaca, now a good number of years ago. So that was very nice. And I'm also very interested in art, in visual arts. You can tell that from looking around my office, and you can also, you, it'll come out in the lecture. I write about everything. I am basically a I'm basically a reflective intellectual. Uh, I can't get away from it. Uh, so I like thinking about why we write in a certain way in chemistry, why we do, why we ask certain questions and not others. In the poetry, I write about the things that poets usually write, about love, about nature, uh, about emo emotions, and I also write about science, and that is not uh, perhaps typical, and it's the hardest thing. I thought it would be easy. It's part of me, after all, so I'm writing about part of me, but, but it's not easy to write about science in my poetry. In my plays, the f science figures, for instance, there are three plays. One just had a reading in town, um, at, by the Reader's Theatre, a play called Should've. And that play dealt on one hand with uh, problems of uh, the social responsibility of scientists and of artists. But it also was a play about three people coming to terms with the suicide of the father of one of them and how that changed their lives. And it was also had a detective story in it. My last play, called Something That Belongs to You, has no science in it whatsoever. It's entirely autobiographical. It's about my mother and me and our survival in World War II uh, when I was a child. So I write about everything under the sun, but science figures a little bit in some of the things that I write. What's hard about science, writing about science, is first of all, I'm thinking about my colleagues looking over my shoulder and getting the science right, but you know they're not looking over my shoulder, uh, which I shouldn't have to worry about it. Some science, a lot of science, is inherently prosaic rather than poetic. That is, it's all about all the conditions that have to be met in order for this regularity or law to hold. It's all about the exceptions. That's why we have all these footnotes and endnotes in scientific papers. But that's not what poetry is about. You don't see footnotes to a poem. A poem is about the language carrying an emotion or a thought, and it's right there. It's got to be all there. So there are some things poetry and science can share a kind of intensity, um, a concentration on 
I'm saying things concisely, emotionally concisely in the case of poetry perhaps, but saying things briefly and concisely has something akin to finding a formula that fits lots of things. But there is a lot about the prosaic character of science that works against it. The other thing is, when I read a poem and you don't understand it, um, you sometimes allow for moments of not understanding and you float on the sound of the words until you hit the next bit of understanding. Now, if too many disjunctions of this type occur, you lose interest in a poem or whatever you're reading. But you're, you, you give the author some latitude on that you're not, you don't need to understand every word. The problem with science is that someone told you in grade school that this is science. If you don't understand it, you're stupid. That's an awful lot of burden to, for me uh, to bear because I want... I want to use the scientific words, but I want the reader to allow me the freedom that they don't understand them, maybe all of them, and then maybe I can catch them again. There are other things which are different, difficult, um, but chemistry maybe gets me close. Um, a lot of science is about universal, so you want equations like E equals mc squared. A lot of poetry is about particulars, like you see a drop of dew on a blade of grass when you go out in the morning, and it's that particular blade of grass and that drop of dew, and you couldn't care less about the biochemistries of the grass or the, what f goes into forming the water. But chemistry is all about very different molecules, very specific molecules and their reactions. So maybe there is something akin to the poetry in that. As I mentioned, I benefited greatly from a core curriculum that e exposed me, whether I liked it or not initially, to world civilization and literature and the arts. And that core curriculum, I think I really benefited from that immensely. Because I otherwise, I might have been racing to take the next science course in a series, and I would have missed that history of art and history of music course. So, first of all, I think that, well, first of all, at the university or college, you're, you're in the most receptive, your world is opening up before you emotionally and personal relationship, but as well in these courses. You can do much more reading than you can do later in life somehow. It's under pressure sometimes. There is an assignment. But I, I think it's a wonderful time for exploring the universe. The world is opening up. A great novel. You might have read conceivably, a novel by Ernest Hemingway in high school. But reading it at age 21 in college, it means something different, because probably you've been in love since that time. And the few years can make a world of a difference in your emotional perception of a work of art, a poem, a painting, a novel. So I think I'm talking to, in part to scientists who are reluctant to take some courses in, in other things. Those distribution requirements are the greatest thing that's happening to you. You may not appreciate it, but they're very important. So first of all, it is much easier to make a living as a chemist than as a poet. <laughs> so. Uh, you do have to take that into consideration. And your parents, especially if they're immigrants, which is true for many students as it was for us, I was an immigrant myself, they're very concerned about having an education, having an education that's portable. My mother's education in Austria to be a elementary school teacher was not portable to the United States when she didn't know the language. But being a doctor might be more so, or an engineer. So there is a concern, but I think that you must also, you have to, 
do what you like doing and you also have to satisfy a need that every human being has for some passion, something spiritual in their lives that need not be a religion, it could be, could also be reading or writing poetry, listening to music, rebuilding a house, could be taking care of a sick parent, but all of these things make you a more complete whole human being. And I think giving in to the pull of the spiritual concerns or building passions is very important for students to do in this time. I have a website for my literary activities. It's rolledhoffman.com and it has uh, some, it certainly, it, it doesn't have some, I haven't yet put some of the text of the poems, but some of those are available online and it tells you about the books I've written for sure. And so people should probably go there to find out about my work.